Next in the EBMT TV studio, we're going to be meeting the Basic Science Award winner from this year and also hearing more about EBMT's initiatives to support basic science. Thank you all for being here with us today. Uh, Comrade Dean, let me start with you and say, first of all, congratulations Thank on you. the award. Um, perhaps you could tell us a bit more about an overview of the study and its key findings. Yeah, so this work really started with a very basic question, which is what happens when you take old stem cells from an adult donor and transplant them into a young child? Can the stem cells rejuvenate or does it lead to accelerated hematopoietic aging? Um, and the, one of the key findings here is that these long-term survivors of pediatric stem cell transplantation show really an increased prevalence of clonal hematopoiesis despite their young age. In the follow-up work that I also presented, we performed an in-depth study of three of these individuals with large clonal hematopoiesis clones at a very young age and performed single-cell whole genome sequencing to really study all the single mutations that are present in individual cells. And we could use this to see when these clonal mut uh, mutations arose. Did they arise after transplantation or during the process? Or were they present in the donor prior to transplantation? And surprisingly, actually, these, these mutations were already present in the donor and uh, at very young age, below, below the age of 10. So what are the clinical consequences of post-transplant CH? And should we be screening for it in these patients? So I think the clinical consequences are not really known. There are some studies that have been done in adults, um, but really in these pediatric recipients, it's hard to say what the very long-term consequences of clonal hematopoiesis will be. In the general population, it's related with cardiovascular disease and second malignancies, but uh, we really have to see if that's also the case in this post-transplant setting. Donald, let, let me come over to you. What was it that stood out about this paper? And, and can you also give us a sort of flavour of the, of the interest and in the submissions that you had? Yeah, I mean, across the EBMT this year, we've seen a super enthusiastic submissions across a broad range of topics, across all of transplantation and CAR-T therapy and more novel areas of interest. And in particular for us, this stood out because it's a very specific group of patients. And I think Conradin's work has really generated an excitement in the field. I think we have a lot to learn about how the pediatric stem cell transplant community should monitor these patients long term. Because for me, scientifically, it generates many questions that Conradin has brought out in his presentation um, for the, in the presidential symposium. And uh, mainly, you know, how should the variant allelic frequencies be monitored? Should we intervene if these clones are changing? So it was super exciting. Mete, what role does basic science play in EBMT and what's the future vision for it? Yeah, I think, I mean, basic science and translational science is actually key. I mean, it's th these type of, uh, of, of, of findings that actually are, you know, they feed the pipeline of better understanding of what we are doing, but also of new developments and improving our therapies and improving outcome for patients, because in the end that is, of course, the goal. Um, you're asking what is the role, I think, uh, at this moment, um, uh, we are trying to engage uh, basic and translational scientists into the community, but I think there's, um, we can do a much better job in that. Um, what would the future vision be then? Yeah, we want to be also the place to be, I mean, EBMT is really the place to be for clinicians in, uh, in, in cell therapy, including stem cell transplantation, CAR T cell therapy, etc. But we also want to become the place to be for uh, investigators, basic and scientific investigators in this field. Yeah, and also to, to be a, a, the place where they can interact and connect with each other. So, Donald, perhaps you can run us through some of the initiatives that are in place or in the pipeline to encourage that and also to support basic science within EBMT. So the strategy of EBMT as a scientific society, as Mete has already commented upon, we have a number of different streams of work. We're really focusing moving forward on integrating basic and traditional science across all of our educational portfolio. We're going to focus on grants available for young investigators to join the EBMT community and longer term think about integration of fundamentals to support this integration such as bioinformatics and, and biobanking strategies. Comrade, what does this award mean to you as a, as a basic scientist? I think this, the work that we did was a collaboration with both like the translational Belderbos group in the Princess Maxima Center and the Van Boxtel group who does more of the single cell whole genome sequencing. And to, to have this uh, award show that the 
that the collaboration that we had really made an impact, both at the basic science and the translational level, is really great to uh, experience. And, and as a young scientist, what support is, is helpful for you? So, uh, I think for such a clinical study where you want to answer a lot of different basic questions, it's really uh, useful to communicate with different scientists that are already answering different sub-questions. And here at the EBMT conference you can also see different companies that may uh, have specific um, essays that you can use to answer these questions. And do you have any unmet needs at the moment that you're hoping to see? I think at the EBMT it's the, the, the initiatives that are there to try and get more basic science here are really great because the, the focus used to be on the clinical uh, studies here and more and more we see that in the, in the field there's also a, a, a need to include uh, more fundamental and methodology in what is actually happening. So having those two really be present at the conference is a, is a great step forward, I think. And what's next for you with your research? Uh, so in this particular research, the, the results that we show are from the first half of our cohort and last week actually the number 300, the final patient of our cohort was included. So the first step would be to um, complete our analysis in the entire cohort. Um, then in the collaboration with the Radboud UMC in Nijmegen, we are also trying to answer more fundamental questions about what specific parts of the transplantation are driving this clonal hematopoiesis. Uh, Mette and Donna, let me just finish with you both. Mette, I'll come to you first. How do you see EBMT expanding its role in supporting the next generation of, of researchers and encouraging innovation in the field? Does, it, does the future look bright? Well, I think, I mean, as you can see, the future looks bright. I mean, with this, this type of very exciting research being presented here, uh, give, getting the reward that it uh, deserves, I think uh, the future really looks bright, and, but we're trying to make it even brighter. So I think we really call out to our colleagues in fundamental and transitional science to come join us. I'm sure people can see we're a vibrant and very active community and we have many streams of work that will attract um, colleagues from the fundamental and transitional science community. And we want to work strongly with societies that are representative such as the European um, Society for Human Genetics and the European Society for Immunodeficiencies, for example. Well, that's all we've got time for, but thank you all so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.